finally important if you don't have water in your soil, uh, microorganisms can't breathe, they can't move around, they can't exchange those nutrients to your plant. So you want moist soil for your plants. And um, the best way to do that to, is to have a layer of mulch down, which insulates the soil, stops it from being evaporated. Um, you know, a canopy layer too of shade at the top. And um, I'll be talking about more transpiration tomorrow. And uh, that insulates the soil, stops it from being whipped out and it allows these microbes to relax. And you find that in a forest, you know how it's going to check the soil, how it's always moist, even if it hasn't rained in weeks. We're talking about how it does that. But because it does that, the microbes can be going, flourishing, and being alive all year round. And they can be pumping out nutrients. If you look in a desert, between rain events, they actually hide in these little pockets you know, around trees. And they kind of get the nutrients from out there. And they just kind of bump it down for the wet season. And, um, and then when it rains, and they get this flourish of growth because they've been waiting so long, so they just pump out and get as much nutrients as they can for the for the next dry. And that's where you see that flourish of growth. But we're not in the desert, we're in the tropics. So we're one person. Yep. Um, so with the watering, yeah. um, like, I'm wondering what the kind of memory of the plants is. So, like, when you're establishing your plants and you don't have that canopy layer yet, mm. and you need to give them some water to get going and yeah. build that layer up, and you're there, like, you can maintain the system at that time. Yeah, yeah. you establish it to get to, to that point. To establish it, yeah. Um, so, that's cool to do that, and then you can just kind of phase that out as it yeah. Establishes and it'll take over. Yeah, yeah. But in the meantime, keep everything constantly moist. Is what you're saying, don't let things yeah. dry up. Well, yeah, with with, with the mulch and yeah. some mm -hmm. microbes. Yeah. You're trying to get those fast-growing shade canopy. So you try to get you're trying to get it off your off the doll as fast as possible. <laughs> yeah. Off your off your help as fast as yeah. possible. Yeah. So that would come down to plant selection, knowing down. what to plant first, I guess, because it's a fast grower. Yeah, fast grower. And, and, um, and you only plant at this stage, which is the first succession of the food forest, you're only planting the plants that can survive without constant water or moisture or that, you know, those systems that we just talked about in the forest environment for the long term growth. You want the hardy plants to go first to build that canopy, to build those systems, and then once they're a bit grown, you can plant the other next layer of trees underneath them. Yeah. They need that extra help. So which might be what you hope to be the climax later on, like you fruit trees yeah. might not go in that first stage. Yeah, yeah some of them might not. Like I was saying, the food forest for a long time, it's, it's, it takes, you know, up to seven years sometimes to establish and be completely self-maintaining. So it's, you don't have to plant everything in one go. You can plant the things that will start off at the start and then which will create the ideal environment for everything else to be planted later on. And getting them the soil fertile. So, and it saves you time in the long run. If you're always maintaining this tree that needs a lot of baby and mm -hmm. needs watering every single day, then it just takes so much of your time and energy and water bills. So you're better off just planting them later on when they can take care of themselves, when they have that shade canopy and they have everything they need to grow themselves. So, yeah, but at the start, every juvenile, you know, babies, you know, they always need a bit of maintenance, they need a bit of care at the start. They can't. And just go, okay, baby, born, get a job. <laughs> but yeah, so when it comes to like seedlings, you, you do need the uh, watering seedlings, you do need to help them establish. <laughs> um, but the, all these things, if you haven't noticed, interconnect. You know, the organisms interconnect, you know, the soil organisms interconnect with the plant, and the water cycle interconnects with the plant and the organisms, which also interconnect with animals, and it, it all kind of interconnects. What, what I'll be talking about is, is concept that I've been coming up with, which is seeing a forest as a grand organism. So if you look at our, our bodies right now, we're made up of an entire a number of different cells which have different purposes. You know, they might be skin cells or you know, heart cells which have to beat our heart or brain cells which allows me to talk to you guys. You know, you know, and they all have these separate roles. But holistically, they have a grander role, which is life and preserving the life or creating life of this organism and it, its ability to grow. So they all work in uniform and they all work together for that common purpose, which is to, to create me and to grow me. And same with the forest. Each plant, each animal, each organism you know, should be considered a different cell of that grand organism, which is the forest. 
And they all work together and talk together like I talked about before. Um, that common goal. But when, when you start putting them in a state of survival, that's when they start disconnecting from each other and start only caring about themselves. And then you get plants that will compete against each other and not work collectively and survive. So it's about establishing that environment that creates an abundance and that surplus so they can work together as a grand organism or as a collective organism so they can all grow together and all flourish together. And they won't need you. You're, you're just there is just to maintain the balance, to understand you're, you're creating this organism, you're giving all the different parts. And if you miss parts or you leave out parts, the mother nature will fill those parts for you. So if you leave out a void, you don't put the microorganisms in the soil, you know, like in the nursery we're talking about, mm -hmm. the sterile soil. If you don't put them there, Mother Nature will be like, oh, I need to put them there for you, and they'll come. They'll always come. Mother Nature's always trying to fill voids. If there's anything missing in this grand organism, there's something missing in your, um, in, your, in your garden, then nature will fill it. And you might not like what it's filling it with. You might not like the, the insect or the weed or the animal that comes into your forest to fill that void. So you're better filling it for you. You're doing it yourself. With what organism that you like. You know, like I'll be talking about how some pests and disease, you know, what we perceive pests and disease, you know, bad fungi or bad insects, you know, actually a tool. And if you, if you supplement those tools and if you choose the right tool for the right job, then you can maintain it and take care of it and use it. Um, for you and for your for, for your food forest instead of against you. You, know, you might not like that particular weed that's filling that void, that gives that nutrient, goes everywhere, can't eat it, takes over your other plants. Then see what that weed's doing and supplement it with a plant that actually does the same purpose but aligns with what you're trying to create. Instead of creating these wars or these issues or these things that you have to fight against, you're starting to see them as okay, how can I work with them? You know, how can I fill these voids, how can I find these solutions so I'm not constantly healing myself against this brick wall. Water, oxygen, anyone, anyone else have any more? There's only like two more. Yeah? Three more actually. Yeah? No? Kind of touched upon it at one point. Mm. Okay, no, they're actually pretty cool. So, I did talk about it, and I was just seeing if you guys were paying attention, but, um, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, so it's, so what do plants need, um, to grow? Talk about this, and then microorganisms, but what do microorganisms need to grow? Water and mud. Yes, they do. Some Water, air. Yeah. Some. Yeah, sugar. You're looking at them right now, probably if you're facing the right angle. Plant? They need plants, yeah. So, for good soil, soil needs plants. You know, soil can't grow by itself. Those organisms need to create those relationships with plants. The plants need to add, add that organic matter. They need to um, add those nutrients to the soil. They need to feed those microbes. Without plants, you can't have living soil. What we found with plants are amazing, that each plant will produce a different flavor of sugar, which will attract a particular type of microorganism. So the more plants that you have, the more diversity, the more microorganisms will be attracted to your food forest, the more things can be done. The more microorganisms that do different jobs, they can do that job for that plant, and then when they breathe, they can help the other plants as well. So the more diversity of different plants you have, the more microbes that you have. The more microbes means the more things that they can do. The more nutrients, diversity of nutrients that they can mine. The, the more the faster the rate that they can collectively break down some organic matter. So you need to create habitat. The best habitat that we found is, is biochar, which biochar has like um, a surface area of like a football field and a teaspoon of um, biochar. Because if you ever had a piece of, biochar is just charcoal really. It's, you know, they have this thing that they say it's like a low oxygen environment. That's all true, but off gases everything, so it's just pure carbon. But it's just really generally, it's just charcoal. And um, if you ever look at a piece of charcoal, you see how it's got little pores? That's only what you can see. It's got pores within pores within pores, but it's got pores that's got pores that's got pores. So it's got these tiny little holes within holes within holes within holes. And that's, that's, uh, you know, that's an apartment. Each one of those holes is an apartment for a different size of microorganism. So it's a skyscraper, a chunk of skyscraper. 
Yeah, and um, and they're also high in carbon, so they're really hard for microbes to break down. So they'll be there for hundreds of years too. But I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you burn your whole forest to the ground and start from scratch. But if there is, you know, fallen trees and you've got surplus of that, get some charcoal, put it down. That's that's a really good way of establishing um, uh, habitat for the microorganisms in your, in your food forest. Our role in a in a food forest is to be custodians to maintain balance. That's what I really believe in the core of my being is that was our job and, and the need for the same way on this earth, in the garden of Eden or whatever, maybe our job was just to maintain the Eden, to make sure. For whatever reason, there's animals have a, their own role in, this, in the ecosystem or on this earth, and, and that's to you know, eat a certain plant or to maintain a balance of this animal or doing something. And for whatever reason, we're, we've got this intellect that can see the past and the future and we see patterns and events and see how that, things correlate with each other which would be really important in a forest to maintain the balance of things because you could see when some a pattern or something's getting out of whack or is going into the bad spectrum and be able to, when you pass experience, it, bring it back into line. So maybe that's our role in the forest, is just to maintain the balance. That could, you know, if oil is doing your old plant matter that's been broken down and what took a billion years of work burning in, in 30 seconds. You know, it's, it's not long term. The only reason why it can exist is because we have the surplus and we have this machinery that can do that, but that, that's eventually going to come to an end. The other thing is that it's not long term, it degrades the soil. And if you think the people, the biggest argument about the food crisis is that currently we're, we just have, we have barely enough to feed everyone using traditional agricultural practices. That's actually not true. 40% of the, the um, food that we actually create goes in the trash. So if you factor that in, <laughs> cut out that 40%. Yeah. Um, and that's a big, big figure. That, and, you know, and the UN study was done. And they found, okay, what kind of advanced technology, what kind of farming system do we need to create? Do we need big machinery? Do we need you know, aerial spraying and you know, like geothermic you know, you know, cloud seeding for extra rain to create better crops? And through that you know, multi-million dollar study, they found that small scale, um, Polyculture is, is the way to go, and um, that's that's the only way that we'll be able to produce food in the future long term to supplement, you know, the increased growth in, in humans. Um, and that's my belief too. But if you think about it even small scale, like if you can feed yourself off like one to three acres using a food forest, then you know, think about how many acres is needed just for one cow to feed you for. You know, It's just not a, it's not a very efficient use of space, it's not a very efficient use of energy. It's not really the point about before. That's how it's self-maintaining, it doesn't need external inputs from external like you know, shipping and all these fertilizers and shipping and all this stuff. Um, and how much food that we can produce, I think it's if we all if we all in the ideal world or a large percentage of us adopt the food forestry and add self-maintaining systems, you know, that's what supply all our food, the surplus of which would be able to feed the city. And that's just my belief, you know, and, and we need to create better food forest systems to actually show that it actually can work. But there's examples of like 100-year-old, 1,000-year-old food forests overseas. You know, most ancient cultures actually had food forests. You see the whole Polynesian islands, they all had food forests. And the first thing that the Europeans did was chop them all down and gave them a handful of seeds. Because then every year they had to plant them and they became dependent on that crop. And then they became dependent on you know, the colonizers as well for the, surf, for the excess food that they needed to get from both. And they didn't need any of those food, and they didn't need the colonizers at all when they had the food for it. It was all bad. It was all abundant. And, um, and, that's, and that's what we've done. We've created dependence, external dependence. And the food for us, it creates you know, independence and sovereignty too. And it creates surplus too. That can be More than enough, think about it, you know, like, one jackfruit tree. One jackfruit tree. Have you guys ever seen a jackfruit tree? Yeah, if we think about it, this one jackfruit tree could feed like a whole family, a whole tribe. And I've seen people, you know, free jackfruits feed like 30, 40 people in a whole bunch. And this is and that's just one tree. You know? We have multiple layers of plants, you know. What's and especially in the tropics, the tropics were amazing. We've got 
like more diversity of edible species in a tropical climate than any other climate combined. This, like I thought talking about Alan Carr, you know, before I thought it was around a thousand a month, it's actually tens of thousands, you know, you know in double digits of edible species that we can eat. And I'm talking not just like, you know, a yellow sapoti and like a, a white sapoti, you know, like, or, you know, I mean, like, different cultivars or different, like, different types of bananas, like dacus and, and ladyfingers. I'm talking about bananas and pawpaws, completely different plants. So there's thousands of edible species, so thousands of different species. And then within those, we can probably make unique flavors and unique um, plants as well. We can make, you know, there's certain pawpaws that are really good for you know, Thai salads, and some that are really good to eat, and some that are really good for animals. So this is, the potential is unlimited. We can make super easy in the tropics if we really want to.